Welcome to Reflections, a program where we discuss values and virtues for the transformation of the individual and the society in general. I am Father George Ehusani, and I have with me once again in our studio our friend, Dr. Sam Amadi. Sam, you're welcome. Father, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, each time I call you here, we have issues to discuss. Sam Amadi was the uh, chairman of the National Electricity Regulatory Commission. Uh, Commission. Um, has a lot of experience, a constitutional lawyer, um, has a, a lot of experience in the issues of, of law and the constitution and how we are running the country. So th this time we are not coming to discuss electricity and regulation. We are coming to discuss something more fundamental, which is to say the Nigerian nation, Nigerian citizenship, and this whole talk about restructuring and the constitutional reform. I have been hearing about constitutional reform since I was born. When are we going to have a constitution that uh, guarantees our citizenship and um, our rights, um, irrespective of religion, irrespective of ethnicity? This whole nonsense of indigenship. Um, when you talk about citizenship, can you at the same time be having to fill forms and say, I'm indigenous of this? And yet, I am a citizen of Nigeria. Uh, how can I be uh, uh, a citizen of Nigeria and I have lived or my father has lived before me in Kano or in Anambra before me for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but I am still not a citizen, an indigenous. So there are rights I don't have. I can't stand for election because I'm, I'm said to be not an indigenous. Yet, I am a citizen of Nigeria. And the Constitution says, as a citizen of Nigeria, I can live and work anywhere in Nigeria. My taxes are deducted where I'm living, where I'm working. And yet, my children cannot have scholarship of that state. Uh, I cannot stand election in that state because I am not, quote-unquote, an indigenous. So, if we are talking of restructuring and talking of constitutional reform, for me, there are fundamentals that make a nation. There are fundamentals that uh, make us warm people, which we have not gotten right. We have mixed up the whole issue of, of, of religion and politicized religion. Uh, so we are now afraid uh, if in my state a Christian becomes uh, the governor or a Muslim becomes the governor, the, the Christians are wondering whether we will have our rights and vice versa. How can we have what kind of... Uh, restructuring don't we need a wholesale restructuring of the nigerian nation and its ground norm the constitution so that uh, a lot of the problems we have been having since 1960 some of which led to the civil war and since the civil war and since 1999 so, the Constitution of 19, uh, 1960, the Constitution of 1964, the Constitution of 1999, uh, as amended each time, we are not satisfied. Which is why, in recent times, the Western states got together and have established what they call a motekum, a, a zonal security outfit. Since they can see that they are not secure, and it appears to be against the letters of the present Constitution. But there is a popular acceptance beyond the West, beyond the Western zone. There's a popular acceptance that this has become an imperative. Absolutely. Good. What's going on? Can we continue to do this patch, patch work, patchwork of constitutional reform? Because the National Assembly is now talking of another constitutional reform. Can we continue this patchwork of constitutional reform? Or do we need a wholesale revisiting of the Nigerian nation and the, the grand norm on which we stand? Uh, well, I think you've raised very important issues. First is that, interest, ironically rather, the, the, the frequency of changing a constitution is both an indicator and a predictor of instability. So It's an indicator and a predictor of instability. Of instability. So it indicates that your polity is unstable because that what I mean is that regularly you are renegotiating fundamentals that ought to have been settled. So you are quite unstable. It also tells us that you are likely going to be unstable in the future because you have put, put those fundamentals into the political basket, which means they are subject to 
the new coalition emerging have a right to revisit them. So, for example, if today we're doing a, a review, maybe a strong voice National Assembly wants some review. Tomorrow, if we do election 2023, another and, person. And a new party, new tendencies are triumphant, then they look back at what has been done and then they see that they want to place the uh, compromise elsewhere. So they, they move for uh, another, another amendment. Then that will trigger a new political alignment. Those who want to defeat that, uh, you know, uh, p uh, constitutional co compromise ad infinitum. So that's why it's both a sign of instability and a sign of predict a predictor of instability. Again, we've seen that we've done several reviews. All, uh, all National Assembly, from the 6th to the 7th, to the 8th, 9th to the 9th, they all attempt to amend. And oftentimes they settle on the mundane things that ought not to be in the constitution. So we electoral, 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 electoral acts. reform is part of it. Mm -hmm. So it creates something, then we we go, go through litigation process, and then an insight comes out from that process that, oh, maybe we're supposed to reduce the time within which cases are settled. Mm -hmm. So we now put the constitution, it must be X period. Then we see under injustice, people have credible cases, they can't get justice because they've been foreclosed by time, not of their own failing. For example, in, in the uh, case that's not been for the Supreme Court for review of making it uh, and was uh, a demand, several other reviews. Technically, the time for retro cases are over for some of those cases. But then there are issues of justice that the pub, the court member. So tomorrow now we write another rule in the constitution changing what we had before. Now what does that tell us? It simply means that the kind of constitutional reform we are doing is dangerous for our democracy. It, it creates the convenience of politics and the wisdom that required for a constitutional document might not be there. So people respond to the immediacy of political outcomes. So we, we go to a process. So we are doing all this ad hoc. Ad, ad hoc, hoc. Ad hocism. So we, we respond to challenges we fail to do. We respond in a wisdom that is time bound. Then tomorrow, when circumstances shift, we discover that our compromise, our structure, our, our intervention was actually more dangerous. So it becomes a case of a cure was than the disease. Hmm. Now, if you sit back and say, look at our constitution, very com a compendium of, of trifles, of very trivial, things that are not important. You, and they compare with the American constitution, you know, you know they establish democracy. It's called that those constitutions are strong, durable, because they are actually stand, they are actually spattered. There they are, they are few words, very, very few. Concepts, Covering fewer few areas. Issues. They focus on the fundamental distribution of power. The first focus on first a definition of who we are, who are we, what our focus as a country, where we want to go to, what model of governance do we want to have? So is federalism they define power, federal and center. They entrench some fundamental basic rights. For example, in South Africa, they move from apartheid to a more inclusive society. Mm -hmm. So they entrench the social and economic rights. A country is poor, we are use of political power was used to, to, to suppress and economically you know, repress mm -hmm. a particular mm -hmm. zone. So the logical thing is to create an entitlement society where the resources will be focused on enhancing human and economic development. A country where there's issues around constitutional litigation, around issues of sharing power in the macro sense, they had a constitutional court. So if you look at the South African new constitution, profiting from where we are today in the discourse around human rights, it made improvement over existing liberal constitution. Okay. That's the kind of thing we want to see. The issues around management of resources is around retail services in terms of what do we get, who gets, who does what, are left for basic laws that are rightly issues that will be negotiated over from time, time to time. So that's, those are not in the Constitution. In the Constitution. Uh -huh. So we don't have to talk about Land Use Act in trend. Today, people are seeing the lapses in the Land, land, land Use Act. Act. It's yes. not even good enough. It doesn't facilitate economic development. No. It deprives locals of their right to land. It hinders uh, agrarian revolution, uh, reform that is critical to unlocking the potential in agriculture. But you have trapped it in the in Constitution. The constitution. So, so until you, you talk, review Constitution. Exactly, you mm. can't get there. This is some of the errors. So the first business should be, if we must review this constitution, is downwards, is to actually strip strip it of all these you know nebulous and uh, you know fantastic notions built around it, or issues around how do you st st uh, stock the courts, how many courts are available, how many should be on the uh, on duty, what the judicial. These are things that should be created by the laws, high court rules, federal high court laws, court appeal laws should go into the business of the compositions of various courts. 
It shouldn't be a consular document because you now discover that there are things that you should change from time to time. They should be part of basic laws of this court. It's enough for the constitution to proclaim like the U.S. Constitution that says case and controversy will be handled by courts created under this constitution. Finish. The courts should have judicial review power over all executive, legislative action. And the courts should not be, the judicial should not be authored by any law. Those are basic things that establish judicial power. You leave it at that. The Bay other laws will not fill in the gap and really de design the institutions of the judiciary how it should be day by day. Now, among the things, fundamentals that should be in such a desirable constitution, mm -hmm. future constitution, what are some of the things? Because I am, like I said at the beginning, I'm concerned about citizenship. Absolutely. And you're right. The critical thing should be in that constitution should be first a sense of what is, what is the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Who are we? Federal Republic, is it a, a, a democratic uh, secular or democratic neutral state, better, better use, or is it a, 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 a new feudal theocratic state? You see, most states in the country, in the world, you can see the state of Israel, for example, is defined in the context of an ethnic state. Ethnic state, Israel. The Jewish state. Yes, so we are Jews. The Jews. So the Jews consider Israel yes. a small state. Mm -hmm. Now, the crisis there is partly also definition. So the Palestinians are in, in, the, in the place territory called Israel. Mm -hmm. They're not Jews. So the two-state option is say, look, can we have an Israeli state that is not defined ethnically? Well, maybe we can't. So we have a Palestinian state occupying the same territory with clear borders. Mm -hmm. Now, Israel, for because of issues around their security and the historical ah, crisis, that. Resist that. so you have a state like that. So other states, you have states that are multi-ethnic. But citizenship is defined not in terms of ethnicity. For example, we had old India before Pakistan broke out. Okay, the idea of Pakistan is now Pakistan broke out largely an Islamic state. So, and Pakistan says we are an Islamic republic. Republic of Pakistan. So these are ethnic religious states. We are membership is defined by virtue of either an ethnic or, or religious, religious identity. Clear. Now, India, the crisis in India now, India is a it's not a, an ethnic state. India is a modern democracy. But then the, the, the new government tries to argue that because it has a Hindu majority, we it, are it a wants Hindu. to define itself as a Hindi state, which carries a crisis, a contradiction. Yes. And so Indian intellectuals are saying, you can't do that. Even though we are a majority, we are a secular, neutral democracy. Even though, so anybody can be, you are, it's, it's, it's clear that most people are uh, Hindu. Hindu. But it's, it's just... It happens to us. It doesn't define the state. And so that's the crisis. You don't have more real states like the United States of America that has several ethnic, geopolitical people confront with. But the definition of who is a member is, is, is defined in a manner that says, look, either by virtue of birth, yes. you know, a linkage with birth, or by virtue of migration, you stay yes. long, you acquire some, your citizenship is defined by, it's, it's legal, is a connection between you and that territory. And you accept and the values of exactly. that society. So it's legally defined. It's not ethnically defined. It's yes. not because you are a Caucasian, it's not because you are from the uh, pre 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 previous Germanic stock, yes. it's not because you, you are, are Indian, India, you are uh, Latino, or you are African. It's because you have a, a nexus defined by law with that territory. So the question we are bringing in Nigeria is that why should our constitution start from section 23 up to 28, 29? The, the, the definition of our citizenship is tied to a concept called ethnic groups indigenous to Nigeria. That's a problem. That's a problem. So it creates a sense in which, okay, even in terms of integrity of our, our, of our, of our territorial system, the, the U.S., are slapping us with ban because uh, there are they some, some of those ethnic cre groups exactly uh, there are cross border border ethnicity. So, mm -hmm. for example, the Fulanese inhabit territories outside Nigeria. The Yorubas inhabit territories, territories outside, outside Nigeria. It's conceivable that the Igbos or other ethnic group may have mm -hmm. contiguous, you know, uh, scattering around West Africa. Now, if you define Nigeria in that. It's difficult to say who's a Nigeria. So anybody who can, whose uh, uh, original identity or ethnic group are indigenous to Nigeria, and namely these three major ethnic groups can claim so. Can claim Ni so somebody speaking Hausa, somebody speaking Fulfude can, be can, can claim to be a Nigerian. Exactly. And you have no way of disproving it. That, exactly. So it, it it has no integrity. We can't be sure. Say so who is a Nigerian, and uh, essentially it also creates a mentality that being Nigerian is prior to a member of an ethnic group that qualifies you to, to be, be a Nigerian. Nigeria. Again, 
You want to have full-blooded citizenship, and in a modern way, what we call democratic citizenship. That everybody who's a Nigerian citizen, whether I attended by birth or attended by legal, you know, stipulation, maybe by naturalization, as the case might be, or even by marriage, mm-hmm. you become a Nigerian. You know that you you are at equal footing with other Nigerians, with every Nigerian. Mm-hmm. And the critical thing about democratic citizenship is that it has an economic dimension. It means that minimum existence to be in Nigeria, the state owes you some degree. State sees you as a Nigerian, therefore you have a claim over that territory called Nigeria and over the institution of power. Okay, take for example, let's even the scripture where when Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen. Yes. He oh, made yes. an appeal to that he said, so to it, Caesar. And yes. the people didn't have to flog him, they didn't have to abuse him. He has a human right yes. to be given fair trial. Yes. Now, he didn't trigger it by virtue of saying, I'm a Jew no. or I'm a Gentile. He triggered it by saying, I, I am, am a, a Roman citizen. citizen. And therefore, to the Romans who understand citizenship and what is legal implication, immediately it immediately limited what they could do with trigger him. In. Yes. So, when you say Nigeria, where citizenship carries those bundles of rights and nothing more, and no other identity triggers it. So, I can't claim I'm an Igbo before the Nigerian state. I can't claim before the Nigerian court or the Nigerian assembly, I'm a Yoruba, I'm a Afro, I'm a Fulani, I'm a Nigerian citizen. And once I can prove citizenship, I ha- I'm clothed with immunity. So what you, what you are saying is that to achieve that kind of citizenship and to build that kind of nation, you need to revisit even the definition of citizens of, of citi- in Nigeria. In Nigeria. Yeah. Uh-huh. So then the whole issue of uh, in this, uh, secular, secular democratic society. Yes, yes, yes. Now, we do have some groups in Nigeria who don't like the word secular. Word secular. Is there something else that we can use? I mean, uh, as against, okay, we are definitely not a theocratic state. Uh, and now, we're not an irreligious state. We, we, we're not an atheist state. We are not an irreligious state. Yes. We are not an atheistic state. Mm. So what can we use instead of secular? Okay, very good. You see, that's the problem. Because the secularity has been either, the context in which it has emerged, the cause of the secular, has suggested some disaffection for religion or mm. even approve of religion and or, we are a very religious, so- society. A religious society which is fine but the idea of secular original in that sense for historically is separation between church and, church state. and state and regional state so i think the cause of neutrality a neutral state now the a neutral state suggests that look there are multiple value systems multiple ideas in the society not just only religious and by the way section 38 of the constitution we talk about the freedom of religion would end there he said Freedom of religion, co- beliefs, and conscience. Mm-hmm. That means there are beliefs that are not even religious beliefs. Yes. They can be metaphysical mm-hmm. beliefs. They can be value-based beliefs. Yes. But all of them are protected under the constitution. A new trust is a state that says we are not going to interfere in what citizens believe. Yes. We're not, we are religious people. We encourage people to be to assess religion. But we as a state, as a government, yes. we will allow you and the only way to guarantee their freedom is that is, we is that are, we are neutral. We are pulling out. Yes. So the idea behind a neutral state is actually an encouragement to religion. You know, yes. people forget that the concept of state neutrality uh, arose out of was championed Abuses. by religious leaders themselves yes. who felt that if you don't create that secular state or neutral state, neutral state, you damage the prospect of robust exercise of religious freedom. Because it's possible that a particular clique in a religion, even if even if Nigeria was all Christian state, yes. if Nigeria was all, all Muslim Muslims, Muslims. Muslims, it's possible that a particular sect mm-hmm. of Islam Take over or, power. takes over power and runs out and we are seeing it in Islamic countries now. We've seen it in Islam, with the crisis between Iraq and Iran are all about groups that feel fervent and take over power and they suppress or groups that are out of power and fighting back in Egypt. In the Islamic Brotherhood, state, yes. Brotherhood, that's what it is. Yes. Even among states, the conflict between the countries, Iraq and Iran, is also about sects that are in charge of different groups that see the other ones as enemy. So, so it's actually in the interest of religious people themselves that the state becomes neutral, that the state is not subject to being captured. Some people, to be used some people suggest the, the concept of multi-religious society. What do you say about that? The danger in the concept of multi-religious is that first, you are saying, it's like Janus head, you are saying that 
the state itself is religious. But instead of being unit religious, it's it multi, is multi religious. It, it accepts it, it and in Nigeria conception historically is Christian Muslim Nigerian state. So the, which is not then, very absolutely correct, correct because we are the, not we're not that. Again, it creates a, that's a it's a destabilizing concept because it presumes that therefore the state can be equally equality. So a multi a multi religious state. So I balance between Christian and Muslims. I give them fairness. But the problem we discover is that it's difficult to treat religious groups equally because the matrix is different and human beings be what they are if a christian be becomes a president or is in charge of power and it's a multi-religious state the tendency to favor pre privilege one religion above it's always there it's always there and that creates that creates a crisis so it's actually it, it, it's it's a it's a facade to say you are a multi religious society and therefore you're going to treat everybody fair. That's not correct because we're not just Christian Muslims. In fact, we, we are even those who are Christian Muslims or whatever they are can also have a zone of unbelief where they don't even subscribe to certain mm -hmm. ideas of those their bigger blocks. So someone can be a Christian and refuse to accept a particular doctrine. Mm -hmm. We can call him and say this is a this person has been ostracized or he's now opposed mm -hmm. at some level. But the the state does not see the person whether it's a, it's a citizen. And so so a, a multi religious state will be dangerous in the long term for democratic rights. So so your position is that in the in the constitution of our dream, the new constitution of our dream. Which will be not, interesting. <clears throat> not all these um, um, ad hoc reforms that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. In the new constitution of our dream it should be seen as a neutral state. And to add to that, it creates coherence because section 10 of our constitution now yes. says Nigeria, no, uh, no state There shall be no state should. religion. Yes. But people interpret to say, oh, it means that the government cannot come and say, we are now Islamic or we are now Christian. No. What it means is that it wants to free <coughs> the Nigerian state and its missionaries from what we call undue intermingling with religion. Well, <clears throat> that section 10 was there. The section 10 has always been there. And the what 10, 11 yes. northern states went and declared exactly. uh, Sharia in those states. Because what made it, what didn't happen was that, if you look at other sections of the constitution, like Chris Islamic Court of Appeal, Chris Dees, there was one grand caddy in the, in the Supreme Court, where that's how Tanko came in, the requirement for two persons knowledgeable in Islamic law and customary law to be put in the Supreme Court. So there's supposed to be one person, two people, customary court. The question is, what's customary law? It doesn't have a, a unity of purpose across Nigeria. There'll be different customs. No. So but the Sharia is a textual, you know, law. It has a text. Even though people may disagree about interpretation. So what else has done it has privileged the Islamic religion. Yes. Because it has put in a position to have a footing in the jurisprudence, in the Supreme Court, and has created something that's nebulous called persons versed in customary law. What's customary law? The custom in the Ghana, of Ghana people is different it's from the different from of it, yes. people of, uh, of other ethnic, ethnic, ethnic group in Nigeria. Therefore, what has created that? We now have two laws, basically. Yes. We have the English, the so-called legal, uh, legal law, and the Sharia it's, it's law, Islamic yes. law. Operating, operating side by side. Yes. And institutionalized. That's where the constitution becomes incoherent. The constitution that says, in section 10, that we should be a secular state or a neutral state, goes ahead in other sections to create institutional legitimacy mm -hmm. for, for a religious a uh, legal system, system that creates a plural conception of Nigerians. So once you have that uh, uh, Islamic law mainstreamed in the constitution, you have actually diluted and defeated the purpose of session and 10 the tension will remain. I mean, and that's what uh, when I spoke with uh, uh, President Wahid, who used to be the former president of uh, Indonesia and the high, one of the uh, highest revered Islamic cleric in, in, in Indonesia and globally. And I asked, why didn't Indonesia, a country like Indonesia, with over 90, agreeably 90 percent or more, is, is like 95 percent Islamic? Yes. At their founding, why didn't they have the Shashari law? He said they deliberately, they themselves, who are Muslims, no Christian, no other religion, the leaders said they're not going to make Islamic law part of the legal system because they wanted to create a democratic neutral state. State with what we call effectiveness, state autonomy. A state exists not to be captured by 
any of the contending ideological or special interests in a society. And that's the concept in development of an effective state. When a state is captured by one of the tendencies or when the mm -hmm. possible capture, the state will be ineffective because it's a unstable state. Any triumphant group that captures the state uses the state to achieve strategic group interest. So if it's a Christian that you know, outmaneuver others and win political power, then you can't rule out that they're going to undertake strategic Christian we, interests. We, we will need, to, we'll need to bring this to an end here and, and then we shall have a second segment to continue this discussion that the whole concept of a neutral state, a neutral state that uh, is like above the various the ideological, ethnic, religious, religious contentions, contentions in the society, it's above it. everyone has a right, the right of being a citizen. Mm, exactly. There are rights of those who are not even citizens, but who are dwelling legally in the society. Covered by the fundamental rights. Covered by the fundamental rights. And you go to your church, you go to your mosque, you have your religious obligations, and so on and so forth. And the state does not get involved. The state does it's not, not get, get involved. involved. But you need protection of police to do your procession, the state you get to provide it. It, provide it. You need um, uh, some logistic support for your pilgrimage, the state provides it. Pro 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 provide it in a neutral sense as a facilitation for <coughs> legitimate activity by citizens. Yes, by citizens. Not in the name of religion. Not in the name of religion. And the, the state does not use state funds to promote religion. To promote any religion. And that's the concept. So what if the state, if you are a pilgrim, going to Saudi, the state knows a citizen, you need support, you need protection, you go, then it happens to you. Maybe the state will ask you, you have the money, you pay for visa, you go, you, you travel. Yes. The state can even make arrangement, but in the name that, oh, this is a bulk movement of citizens, they yes. need some logistic support. Yes. The state can provide it. Yes. It's not provided because Allah says so, no. or provided because Jesus says so. He provides it because this group is large. Yes. This group needs support. The state can even spend money to provide logistics, but provide it because the same way can do with pregrims yes. or Olympic team, yes. or if there's a Nigerian contingent that's going to take 200 people yes. to go and do go in the quiz or uh, the state. Anything, yes. So the idea here is it's not that the state will not support people who are doing it. You know, the state is not supporting you because this is religious activity. It's supporting you because this you are citizens. By citizens, and this activity has benefits, even if it's religious or educational. Yes. It has benefits. For for the society. For the society, directly or indirectly. So if our citizens travel abroad for excursion, for tourism, for religious activity, it has benefits. But the state is not flagging it as we are committed to this religion. On that note, we'll bring the segment to an end. I've been speaking with Dr. Sam Amadi, former chairman of the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission and a constitutional lawyer, and we have been discussing the desirability of a new constitution for Nigeria, not the patchwork of constitutional reform by every national assembly that we seem to be uh, on again. And that he is saying this idea of constantly reforming constitution is an indication of instability, instability the in the country mm -hmm. and also a predictor of further instability in the society. So I'm wonderful having you. Thank we you. would uh, have another segment. You run a system where only the children of the rich get well educated. We are shooting ourselves in the feet. Because the educated and this elite are maybe about 5% of the population. Which means 95% of the children are there. Mm -hmm. And among these 95%, probably there are the 50% of our geniuses. Yes, and brilliant that, we have, people. that we have neglected. We have completely neglected them. Mm -hmm. Among the 5% children of the rich people, more than half of them will be useless anyway mm -hmm. because they have not lived, they have not learned to be trained. Yes. At the end of the day, the whole society has lost. Yes. But if we made effort to expose the children of the poor to a minimum of education, among them will people who will transform society. Tran and solve the problems that we are all yeah. talking yeah. about. Yeah. The problems which they have seen. Yes. And the problems with the children of the present rich people are not see. I have with me in the studio once again our friend Sam Amadi. Thank you very much. Dr. Sam Amadi is former uh, chairman Nigeria Electricity Regulatory Commission. He is a, an experienced lawyer. And a uh, the university teacher now. Basically. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> uh, he teaches law in uh, Bayes, Bayes University. University yeah. uh -huh. And then, of course, um, a social commentator, a uh, very clean, clear voice on issues of our national concern, especially now that we seem to be at a crossroads uh, once again. Yep. We're at a crossroads again. 
when it comes to issues that are very constitutional. Uh, in recent times, we have the we had the elections, 2019 elections, that have led to all kinds of um, outcomes in the Supreme Court that uh, Nigerians are worried about, including the Imo State uh, uh, elections and uh, the outcomes. Then, in recent months, the Western Zone in Nigeria, meaning Lagos, Ogu, uh, Oyo, uh, Ekiti, Ondo, and so on. They have uh, set up a security outfit called Amotekon. There's been a lot of controversy over it, but on the level of the people, there seems to be some acceptance that it is imperative, it is necessary. Why? Because in recent years, there's been such insecurity in this country that people are feeling unsafe. And of course, the police are incapable of policing the Nigerian people. We've been discussing the idea of state, community, state or community police for a long time and it uh, seems to be rejected. Nobody has taken it seriously. Now, when people are in their homes or in their farms and they are being invaded, communities are being invaded and sacked, and we call the state governors, the chief security officers in their states, and what I see them doing is taking the bull by the horn to say, look, I am supposed to be constitutionally the... Um, chief security officer in my state, if I need to keep begging Abuja to send me police to protect us and we're not being protected and my people are dying, then I have a natural responsibility to do something about it. Meanwhile, even before this Amotekun, we have had all kinds of vigilantes operating legally in many states. And um, they are not called police, so perhaps they are not against the, 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 the constitution, since they are not called police. Even Amotekun does not call itself police. Mm -hmm. And from what we are seeing, Amotekun, they are saying that, okay, if they arrest anybody, they will hand over to police to, to, to prosecute. So, uh, perhaps, technically, they are really not violating the law. The law. Mm -hmm. So, Sam, what is happening in Nigeria? Um, the whole fundamentals on which our nation is standing, we, they seem to be shaky at this moment. Uh -huh. And then we have, uh, in the last uh, uh, five years, nearly five years since uh, the present regime, APC regime came in, we have had issues of serious concern about inclusivity. That a number of people are feeling not included in the um, scheme of things and so on. So once again, we are beginning to hear, oh, we don't want to be part of Nigeria. Oh, we need to talk. We need national conference and so on and so forth. For me, the Amotekun scenario um, the development is, is a pointer to some shaky foundation for our nation state. What do you have to say? Well, I think clearly uh, Amotekun is a vote for regionalism. A vote for regionalism. In, in reality, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's not a scaling back, but the initial articulation of a zonal security network it's actually a vote for regionalism in the sense that the Southwest, uh, and we've seen de facto move towards regional, you know, we, we have the dawn, the, the development agenda for, for Southwest, uh, for Western Nigeria, that has done a lot of job in terms of in fact, in, in developmental integration in the Southwest. We've seen a, a de facto move towards regionalization in Nigeria today. Administratively, development-wise, the Southeast Forum meets, they have several... Southeast Development, you know, commission or things that are working together, interested to develop, you know, regional wise. If you go to the north, the northern, northern governors forum, the northern, all kinds of, we are going back to regional development model because of two factors. One, there's a collapse of the Nigerian state. In there is a collapse of the institutional sense that, for example, policing. Many parts of this country are basically ungoverned territories. Look at a state uh, like Niger, so large, a big. As big, you know, very, it's very the biggest, biggest landmass. Land yes. Reports about banditry in the form in which people be driving and suddenly everybody will stop and they said, These guys have taken over. The people will wait and run away. And then, so basically, there's on, too many ungoverned territories in Kassina, in Zamfara, in, Zamfara. in the east, in the west. So we've lost territory. The Nigerian state, the first. So beyond place, Boko Haram. Apart from Boko Haram, we have this in whole... Fact, banditry tells a bigger story of state failure because Boko Haram can be an organized military invasion against Nigeria. So Nigeria yes. is in a combat sort of 
with this uh, terrorists mm -hmm. who have sophistication, gain some territory, stay in uh, one place and engage and put their flag and put the, and fight the. So we know we, we can say okay, fine. The state is fighting some insurgents, so said. But banditry in a rampant manner is a, a much more predictor of state failure. Because that's it that's that, like anarchy. Exactly, means that some ragtag guys can you know they capture here, they fight here, they kill. So that's a story about security. The security in Nigeria. The critical point that is ethnicized perception wise, people feel that it hasn't got the professionalism and the universalism in, in the universal capability. For example, people allege, oh, if you catch a, a criminal, let's say a killer henchman, we hand him over or hand over to the police, and the police later release that killer henchman, mm -hmm. no matter his, his ethnic identity. Now, it tells me a story as a farmer, as a villager, that I can't trust this police. Yes. So there's a deficit of social trust. The policing platform is not professionalized. We talked about, we talked about what about a lady who was killed, uh, who, who was to work in Villa, who says she, she uh -huh, was a director. Killed, a director. Now, the story coming out is that the director saw some miscreants, some Yahoo people, some criminal element in her neighborhood. She reported to the police. The same police told the criminals that she was a the, the informant and they went and killed her. Now, oh no! So this narrative tells a story of total lack, lack of capability, state cap capacity, trust factor, professionalism. So in that mode, Amoteku is says two things. One, we can't trust the national mm. police. Yes. In terms of its efi efficiency, efficiency capability, yes. and even its value system, and, and, and even its neutrality. Neutrality. That's what I'm saying. That it's. It's, it's not unprofessional because the idea of a national police security is that the state is neutral, like we yes, said before. Yes. A neutral state, therefore, will enforce the law irrespective of the identity of the criminal. Yes. But when a state is security apparatus is not ethnicized yes. or percep in perception, perceived, to, perceived be, to be ethnicized, yes. regionalized, and, Christian, uh, and regionalized, it means that the people don't trust again. So I'm going to proceed from that point. We can't trust this police. They, they are they are compromised. They can't deal with this challenge of header farmer conflict. They can't deal with the challenge. So we have a responsibility to protect our territory. So default mode is the right of preservation. So we opt out. We we transgress the legal framework because the legal framework would have been there's one Nigerian police force and therefore there should be no security outfit other than maybe vigilante that supports. And you know what is interesting about the Amotecom yeah. is that some of those governors who have promoted this. Belong to APC. So, so interesting fact because they, 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 they too are responding to the politics of the zone. The, in order for them to remain in good standing before their own people, before their people <clears throat> they have to follow them in that perception of transgression. This is a transgression. The law is clear. The Nigerian police force, the states can perhaps support them as they do with grants, with buying Very vehicles cool, well. and all kinds of intelligence gathering platforms, vigilante, you know. But Amutoku is not that. Amutoku is a bold statement to say. I mean, look at look at the launch. It was a big bold statement. We're going to form a Yoruba security outfit. That's what it translates to. A Southwest. And it was given a Yoruba name. Of course, a Southwest is a, in, in, in Nigeria's own ethnic uh, definition. It's a Southwest Yoruba, approximately, because no other ethnic mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. It's indigenous, the same Nigerian conception of indigenous to, to that zone. So what that means, therefore, is that it's a vote for regionalism. In a sense, in a security matter, the South was, I want to go presaged a regional framework to protect a region from the failure of the Nigerian state. And the, the, what that means, therefore, is that if we don't get back to a, a drawing board and say maybe constitutional conference to redesign and affirm basic value systems and framework for coexistence. We might have a centralized legal regime, centralized constitutional regime, but our actual governance is, 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 is regional. Is and our response to crisis is regional. So Amutoku, you know, kind of builds on that sentiment. But after confrontation with the, the federal mm -hmm. state, uh, the, the architects retreat into a, a concept of sheen of community police. That's not in community policing in Amotoko as originally conceived. So community policing is adjunct to the Nigerian police, just like a support system. Mm -hmm. That's not, in fact, the Niger community policing is Nigerian police or initiative to kind of decentralize intelligence. Yes. So, but Amotoko is, no, it's a vote for regionalism. Amotoko is 
police in another with another name. Police for a, a regional police. Mm -hmm. It goes back to 1966 before 1966 when we had a regional government. Mm -hmm. So you have a regional government, regional police. You know we used to have our regional police. Yes. The police in each of the region, mm -hmm. Northern Nigerian police, native, uh, native authority, po police. authority police. So that was a, a regional police. They operated with their own authority, derived from a regional constitution. So basically, the question therefore is. Is Nigeria ready to go into a political constitutional moment to redefine itself? Either affirm our kind of federalism, either affirm a regional regionalism, either affirm what they call true federalism, whatever that means, meaning essentially physical control to federating states or regions, as the case might be, a large degree of economic uh, self governance for those regions. Now, of the now as we discuss all this, let me ask are the people in power? At the local government level, state government level, and particularly the national level, each time, are they aware of the seriousness of this matter? Are they aware that there are these fault lines, these cracks in our nation state, that actually, if care is not taken, can lead to a major collapse? A because what I, what I seem to th see, what I seem to observe in all these years is that each time a crop of Nigerians find themselves in power. It's like this is the best time. Still war. Yeah, it's like it's like everything is okay from their perspective. Absolutely correct. Uh -huh. um, and everything is not okay. Everything has never been okay. That's a, that's a reason for that. Yeah. The Nigerian political economy, the Nigerian economy and its politics does not synthesize to responsiveness. It does not lend itself to leaders being responsive for three reasons. One, Electoral process is totally shambolic rigged. Our elections are not competitive. So incumbents can get themselves in, into, re, 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 re elected, re elected easily. So because ele elections are not responsive to actual socioeconomic happenings, the fact the, the tendency, the incentive for incumbents to really open their eyes and respond to crisis is not there. Is low. S second is that it's a rentier state. So as long as that's a, we can always have resources flow in. Take, for example, Northern Nigeria is basically now, with all humility and decency, a disaster zone. But about 8 to 10 of the governors reside in Abuja. in Abuja permanently. Yes. We've had a story about governors who have never visited their domain. So the allocations... Yeah, I was reading recently of a governor who this year has not been... This year has, has not been to his state. Fact, was, uh, the governor of Tatara, but we sure have been reported to have been in Abuja for more than at least four to six months. Now the question is, allocations go in. Governors happen. They share the money. You know, They invest, they do a few things. But the governors don't have any need to be there. To, to be there. And therefore, the, this crisis of insecurity, this murderous insecurity where people are dying, killed, 30 people in Kassana, the next day you hear about 30 people, villages ransacked. They don't, they, they, the responsiveness is low because the consequence of no response is very low. It's also very low. So the perception of this crisis is doesn't hit them because, you know, let's just... And they can get elected again in spite of all these failures. Let's blunder through. You know, we do, you know, let's blunder through. We keep moving. We keep kicking the can down, 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 down the road because they get elected. Who, who is doing the election? First and foremost, even if they are voters who, are, who, who come out to vote, they themselves have been trapped in either religious or ethnic, uh, you know, group think. They themselves are, have little capacity to do reflection and say, okay, People vote even for their enemies. People they ought to vote out. They vote mm -hmm. them in mm -hmm. because the narrative of helplessness, the narrative yes. of hopelessness, and the narrative of lack of agency and accountability is deep. But uh, uh, is it now we're back on the people. Now we've been talking of the the leaders, the mm -hmm. governors. Are the people as helpless as they feign, as they pretend to be? Are we really as helpless as we pretend to be? Because you see, when you see the kind of characters that are getting into positions in this country. And you look at Nigeria and the quality of human beings that we have produced in this country. Okay, look at the U.S. Recent research shows that the national group that is the most qualified national group in the U.S. are Nigerians. So why do you think they don't want diaspora vote? You see, that's the point. The thing about diaspora is that diaspora is the community that has both incentive, the knowledge, and the independence to effect change. Most of the people who are smart, intelligent, yeah, are connected to that 
crisis. And they said that they are benef benef benefiting. The Nigeria state is very powerful. It's a co-opting state. So it can co-opt a few who show capacity to destabilize it. They co-opt you. If you look at our governors, they, are, they have young commissioners, young special advisors, who are, who are part of the, 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 the make-believe of governance. There's little governance happening in the country in terms mm -hmm. of re-governance. It's a make-believe. So once these people are co-opted and they're part of that drain, that resource drain, then you have taken them away from those who will be the opposition. So in Nigeria, the business of opposition is very difficult, not rewarding. Because ultimately, if you had a... Yeah, but they, they, I mean, the, the person who wins, the winner takes all. all. So if you had a good electoral system, so you can say, okay, guys are going to go to the trenches to be sure that the, the umpire is neutral, the process is transparent. We are going to work hard to convince the people that the enemy is the government. And then we we'll know that in the next four years or three or four years now, these guys will be off, any people will emerge. And the guys who go there have a sense that their actions register in terms of accountability. You see, the Nigerian system is not accountable in a, in a close down. So you need some kind of revolutionary, not necessarily in a physical a revolutionary moment where people themselves understand the underlying cause of seeming helplessness and rediscover their agency that, look, we can actually change things. So you wonder, for example, look at what's going on in the Northern, the insecurity that's going on there. People are still talking about transactions. Money is still being moved. Oh, sure. Every day, the government focus on more allocations. Somebody has to spoken today. There's a bill in the National Assembly about a rehab agency for the reputation of Boko Haram repentance, mm -hmm. called insurg those who ins insurgents who are repentant. So we're going to create a commission. If that bill passes, told through and signed, and then a commission, they're going to allocate money to that. So the concept of this senator about transformation. In Northeast or anywhere, is, is, is vote, to create a vote, 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 vote money, vote money, create a bureaucracy and a commission to, in, in, a, in a futile sense of dealing with if people are already repentant, then mainstream them into economic activity. What yes. is an agency? Yes. So, so that tells you that they, 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 that there's a pathological ailment here, a pathological misdiagnosis and misfocus because these leaders are complicit. There's an economy. Underwriting this chaos, the the the, the insecurity. The chaos the is an enterprise. It's an it's an enterprise. So the entrepreneurs driving this are disconnected from any form of accountability. To now, the only way this will work is if this insecurity is creeping to Abuja, so there's no more safe heavens. National Assembly is into emergency meeting on a simple threat, perhaps not credible. From Shakar, 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 uh -huh. the Boko Haram leader, yes. who does a threat, threaten them, is going to deal with them. And now, National Assembly is creating. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they want the they emergency want to, situation. Because this is their fortress. They have left all these guys. Have they have left their, all those places and they are in Abuja. They are in Abuja. So if Abuja falls, like in a wartime, so the fall of Berlin, Abuja, has, Abuja f f falls. They have no hiding place. They will have skin in the game. The problem of this country with this crisis is that there's a high level of irresponsibility deriving from the fact that they, those who ought to solve the problems are insulated from the consequence of not solving the problem. Thank you. I mean, the whole idea that the roads are not good, you buy big SUVs and you ra ra and ride, you ride roughshod. Yeah. Uh, there's no security, you have kill you and go. You, 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 you arm yourself you more. You arm you yourself more. more. Yes, battalion. battalion. For so you keep protecting yourself irrespective of the situation in the society. So there's no link, organic link between the people and their leaders. Yes. Because these people have been demobilized financially. They have been pauperized. They have also been used education and religion in some cases and culture in some cases to further demobilize them. So they don't see their condition as deriving from the actions are in of actions this of this people. So they first accept it's God, whatever it is, they now dehumanize themselves the further, and the worst case now, they resort to banditry. So this insecurity, banditry, and criminality are up. They it, are symptomatic, it's it's symptomatic of exactly. what is going on. People are revolting. They know that there's something wrong with the system. And then they, 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 they will now democratize that Way anger. Too. So there is a moral collapse. There is what I would call um, naked public square. The public square is denuded. Denuded completely. completely. But how come I am able to see it? You are able to see it. A number of our guests on this platform were and able we're to see it. We are unable to do something. How? No, no, not just that we are unable to see it. 
how come these characters cannot see that the soil is being dug from under their feet? They, how yeah. I mean, recently you know how I I mean I issued a statement in yes, church about yes, about the 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 um uh, revenge of the poor. The poor, yeah. Now, I can see it coming. You can see it coming. A number of people can see it coming. How come the people occupying power cannot see it? This is, this is a great point you've raised. And in the study of collapse of society, the question people ask is that three things happen. One, those at the World Tower don't see. So what you call unpredicted surprise. People don't know that the events are coming. Second, people see the signs. They interpret it differently or they claim it's not yet time. So the selfish interest, lethargy, they're not able to mm -hmm. move and act. And thirdly, people see these signs, but somehow they think they'll be exempt. So the point you raise is that how come the leaders don't see this coming? Anarchy. Them? Anarchy. Well, some of them have a sense, but the, the crisis of our state is that short-termism. People see that for now, the, the attraction, the, 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 the luxury of doing nothing and dwelling in wealth. It's more convenient. It's convenient and it's compelling. So then... The you know the foresight of say so, okay maybe the next this thing can become we everything can collapse in the next ten years so I think we have a combination of factor that our like I said before our politics which is the incentive structure which is what determines behavior in the social sense is wired against effective action because the the the, 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 the there's no responsiveness between well, 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 problem not, and not, not too long ago we watched on TV the humiliation of uh, Bashir in uh, in Sudan in, in Sudan. We watched the humiliation of El Bashir and all his cabinet members. We watched that unfortunate humiliation. Even in Zimbabwe. Yeah, even in Zimbabwe. The, the end of so, you mean our people cannot see this and say that what happened in Sudan can happen here if we do not take remedial actions? And yeah, Father, I'm saying that all through history, we've seen from hindsight societies that should have moved differently. I wonder, didn't they see it happening? It's a classical case of the Titanic. We, s we always see from hindsight mm -hmm. that there were cases where people should have woken up from slumber. The, 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 the signs were all there. The party should have ended. The dancing and the merrymaking should have ended. In the yes. upper class should have ended long ago. People saw the the, the, the noise, see some water coming in, and they were bailing out water. With, they sent the, the, the laborers to go and bail water with cork. Co they bail it away. Oh, it will stop. The storm will stop. Instead of stopping the party, party, let's I'm finding hope, your way. Yes. I'm finding way. Let's just hope it will stop. Send more uh, workmen, send more uh, 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 laborers to go. So it, it will sit back and say, "This was pre predictable surprise." That's the word we use in in in, in science of behavior. Predictable. He could see, but this is predictable. But it's a surprise suddenly. So the point, therefore, is that there is a certain more force power of institutional or gravitational force that. Keeps people in where they are. Well, is it is it a matter of the Yoruba saying that when the when the gods want to uh, destroy somebody, they make him mad. mad? So, are we having a situation where our leaders, um, in order to destroy this society, our leaders are temporarily insane or something? They are, and we who ought to shake them out of their insanity. Insanity. Uh, it, we are seduced. We are entrapped. We are. It's like a spell, mm -hmm. and we are powerless. And some of us are driven by our need to be co-opted. So so I just wonder sometimes I was today I was reading the papers and seeing all the I said, can't people really stand up? Take for example the National Assembly. We had a National Assembly that was controversial, co mm -hmm. They now we now got a one that was it's not conciliatory. Mm -hmm. Now the question is the level of incompetence in governance in this country manifestly, the level of failures even the infighting, the crisis that we are talking about, mm -hmm. we are hearing about every day, that we can't even guarantee the, the, the integrity of, of, the, of the highest of the level team, of governance. Of the team that of are, the, yeah. You can't even be sure that this document is what it is. At this level, shouldn't it provoke a National Assembly concern about the quality, about even the authenticity, about even the credibility of executive action? It cannot. So we are sitting here Pampering. People are speaking in tongues. So we are blaming either the generals, we are blaming X, Y, Z, but we can't say, look, we, we have somebody who is authorized to govern. And if, for any reason, the team is in disarray, sir, sit up, take charge, tell us why, who is actually in charge. We can't say that. So we have created for ourselves a, 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 a 
like the Jews, they then they said, okay, let's go and make for us a molten image. And let's be worshiping worship. So we created a uh, uh, molten image, image by ourselves, designed it, and we're worshiping. And, and then that's that's what I'm saying. We are in trial. There's no deliverance for us because the conscience are there. We see the signs. We see that things are not working well. But somehow the the illusion is so comfortable. I mean, it, this problem is going to end either by design or default. In the previous uh, uh, segment, we discussed about um, the constitutional uh, reform, a new constitution, so that we don't we don't uh, go where we are headed. Um, I will plead with Nigerians to say, look. They say, if you do not change your course, you end up where you are headed. Mm -hmm. Where we are headed is destruction. Where we are headed is anarchy. Where we are headed is reckless, you know, you know, plunder. And failure, poverty. Failure. <laughs> Why don't we do something by design? Why don't we design a soft landing so that we don't end up in the anarchy that we are facing? Absolutely. This, this is my own plea with Nigerians that group of Nigerians that are constantly complaining about Nigeria. We are, we are very good at complaining. Why don't we begin to say, so how do we design a soft landing so that we don't crash? And that rests the hand of the political leaders in the National Assembly. For example, those who have majority can stop any action. Yes. But those majority can come and see that it's a collective failure in our part. Yes. Collective pain. Yes. This crisis, whether it's in the north of Nigeria or the south, is going to be consume all of us. So why can't you for the first time and sit back and say, let's forgo our numerical advantage, yes. let's forgo our political advantage, yes. let's now see a community of pain. Put aside the privileges of our world. A community of pain. Yes. We are all pain. We are hurting as yes. a people. Yes. Can we sit together and ask ourselves, how do we solve this problem? My prayer is that our leaders, uh, uh, those, who, those who are elected or those who claim we elected them, people who are in positions, will begin to see this so that we do something and make a turn around so that this beautiful country, Nigeria, will not crash. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. I've been speaking with Sam, Dr. Sam Amadi, uh, a lawyer and a teacher of law at Bayes University, former chairman of Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. Wonderful having you. And these ideas, I would ask you to please put them in form of a memo. I will do that. Uh, that. Uh, yeah, put that. them in the form of a memo so that uh, people, more people will read about this and hopefully more people will be calling for these changes. Absolutely. Thank you.